And I am super excited to welcome our panel member to the uh, stage. Uh, and our panel member today, we've had her on before. Her name is Bonnie O'Leary. She's a certified peer mentor and hearing loss support specialist. She's the outreach manager for the Northern Virginia Resource Center for Death of Hard and Hearing Persons. And I can tell you, I've known her for years and she is a wealth of resources. And Bonnie, um, I, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, but the uh, my, my fondest memories of you were 14 years ago when I did this little social experiment where I moved into a bunch of senior living communities. You came to almost every talk that I gave and um, your question was, what are these communities doing to support older adults? And the other thing that you made me very aware of is how challenging background noise can be to an individual with hearing loss, even if they've got the best hearing aids in the world. Um, that background noise, everything can be amplified when we have hearing aids. And uh, sometimes that background noise, while we might like it, or, or when I say we, while, while someone that doesn't have a he hearing loss might think that the background noise adds a nice mood in, in, to uh, a room, um, it can be very frustrating to somebody with hearing loss. So anyways, B Bonnie, uh, I hope that didn't embarrass you. And, and but let's let's before we dive into your talk, uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself um, and. Uh, oh, okay. oh, shoot. And you know what? Uh, thank you. I just glanced over chat. Let me let me enable chat for whatever reason. Um, OK, chat is open for everyone. I apologize for that. I, I need to look into the settings. Um, so I apologize for anybody that was trying to use chat and couldn't. I've turned that on now. Um, thanks, Joan. Uh, two days in a row, Joan Green on these, this call. Thanks. Um, OK. Um, and, uh, and, and, and somebody else said, uh, I, I talked about Maryland Relay and Virginia Relay, Bonnie. Um, are you going to talk about the relay services today? Not really. I'm going to be mentioning very briefly, but the focus of this is actually um, more on what healthcare professionals need to know about hearing loss and communication. So okay. I will have a slide on the Virginia relay, but not on the other ones. Okay. I'll make sure to drop some links in there on the relay services for folks to look into that. So okay. anyways, I'm babbling as usual. Bonnie, I'm, I'm excited to dive into your discussion, but but give give folks a little bit of your background and, and who you are. Okay, well, very, very briefly, I was born hearing and I could hear perfectly until I was almost 50. And in my hearing years, I had a great time working in advertising in New York City and in London. And when I came back here and settled in Northern Virginia, I had a recording studio for 10 years. So I was making people go deaf before I really understood all of that. And then after I started to lose my hearing, I was lucky to get a job with the Northern Virginia Resource Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Persons. And my task was to develop an outreach program for adults aging into hearing loss because I've sort of been there, done that. So in a nutshell, that's it. And I am very hard of hearing. In fact, if I take out my hearing aids, I am now completely deaf. Wow. So even with hearing aids, I struggle. So in the end, if you have questions, Steve might have to help me along here, <laughs> uh, but, but we'll get through it. The, great, okay. and. And this really makes you quite an authentic presenter. And uh, just just so everybody knows, is is that Bonnie has got her um, closed caption running um, on her phone, and we've got the closed caption here. Can, can just out of curiosity, Bonnie, can you see it on the screen now? Yes, I can now, but I haven't put my slides but up. But you I have my your slide. My... You can't see it. It's okay, good. got it's it. Okay, okay. So, so should I share my screen. Absolutely. And and uh, so a couple of requests for you and for the audience. First off, Bonnie, 
as you go through your presentation, feel free to take a few breaks and um, check in with me in case there's some questions that popped up that we should address. And then to the audience, as Bonnie is talking, you can type in your questions and we'll make sure that we address it before the end of the discussion. Okay, that's fine. I like my whole discussion takes about 40 minutes. So I like to be sure to get done on time. Um, okay. so that everybody can get on with their day also. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Um, so do I share screen now? Absolutely. And okay, that looks good. Set this up here. Move that up there. Okie dokie. So am I good to go, Steve? You are. Everything okay. is great. <laughs> All righty. So welcome to our discussion today about the challenges of hearing loss for caregivers and healthcare professionals. I'd like to give you a brief introduction to our organization, and then we're going to have a basic understanding of hearing loss and some of the limitations of hearing aids and cochlear implants. We're going to look at some amplifiers and apps and finish up with communication environments and strategies. And if it's possible to have questions at the end, that will make this go a little bit more smoothly. But it's OK if you have a question while I'm chatting away. Yeah, what I would say then, let's let everybody just type your questions in during the discussion. And then at the end, we'll make sure to get to them all. Right. OK, that's good. So NVRC, which stands for the Northern Virginia Resource Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Persons, has a mission to empower deaf and hard of hearing individuals and their families through education, advocacy, and community involvement. We provide a broad array of services, which include information and referral, outreach and education, mentoring, we have a weekly email news service. We do hearing screenings and have an ASL interpreting program. And of course, as I said, advocacy for deaf, hard of hearing, late deaf and, and deaf blind individuals in Northern Virginia. You can visit our website at nbrc.org to learn more about us, download fact sheets, keep up with the community calendar, and generally keep up with what's going on. This is our main entrance and we're a nonprofit. So our funding comes from contracts, our largest one being with Fairfax County. And we have one with Arlington County, Loudoun County and the Virginia Department for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, which is the state organization down in Richmond. This is a popular spot, our device demonstration room. And folks who have hearing loss can come in here and see the kinds of devices that are available. My coworker, Debbie Jones, is our technology manager. She has actually done a program for Steve in the past, and she knows all about everything that is in here. We don't sell equipment. This is simply a place to come to see the kinds of things that are available. Debbie will help help you get them. She, we have the catalogs. We know who the suppliers are and the vendors for this kind of equipment. All the phones are plugged in and you might think, well, gosh, who has a landline anymore? But you'd be surprised at how many people still have a landline. I'm one of them. I have captioned phone both at work and at home. And all of these phones are plugged in. So you can try the amplification and the clarity and see if they work for you. Down at the end, we have down here, that's my little mouse. These are the sample caption phones and you can also make a caption call to see how they work. And we have TV listening systems here so you can see how that goes. The TTYs are over here. They're generally being phased out within the deaf community, but people who can take advantage of TTYs are folks who have difficulty speaking. So it works well for them as well. And then we have alerting devices over here, the alarm clocks and smoke detectors and uh, telephone alert systems, that's all along here. And then personal amplifiers here. You have to have an appointment. 
And because of COVID, the appointment needs to be between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Even though things are easing up, we're sticking to this. Visitors must wear a mask. And if you would like to handle equipment, we keep a box of gloves in the room so you have to put the gloves on. So let's talk about hearing loss, the invisible disability. I want you to think about people who are deaf and hard of hearing as being on a continuum. We're usually lumped together, the deaf and hard of hearing, the deaf and hard of hearing. But even though we are bonded through our mutual needs for special communication, we're really very different. If you know anyone who is culturally deaf, and that would be a capital D deaf, this is someone who is born deaf into a deaf family, worships at deaf church, attends deaf school, their socialization is within the deaf community, and they use sign language to communicate. Somebody like me has a lowercase d deaf because it simply refers to my audiological ability to hear. So that's the difference when you sometimes see capital and lowercase. So moving along the continuum, there are people who consider themselves oral deaf. Our former executive director was someone who claimed that she was oral deaf because she was born hearing and she lost her hearing when she was about seven to spinal meningitis. So she had acquired language at that point, at least enough so that she had a good memory of language as she was growing older. Her parents put her in regular school. She was mainstreamed. She had note takers. She had speech therapy. She had whatever it took to get her through high school and college. She got her degree in journalism. And then she learned sign language when she was in her 20s. So anybody who knew her from that point onwards would remember she voiced and signed at the same time. And then you have the hard of hearing community. This is an enormous demographic, but even within the hard of hearing community, there are differences. Some people are born hard of hearing or acquire that during childhood. Others like me are what we call late deafened adults. And even within my group, there are differences. I was lucky that my hearing loss was gradual, but I've met more people than I can count who've gone to bed hearing and woken up deaf, which is a whole different situation. So all along this continuum, there are differences in communication preferences, the degrees and types of hearing loss, the suddenness and age of onset, and how we live with our hearing loss can depend on something as simple as our age or our gender, our culture, which becomes a little bit more complicated, our support system, our financial stability, behavioral patterns, our cognitive abilities. Where are the resources? Right here in the Washington DC area, we're very lucky because we have lots and lots of resources here. But if you're way out in the country, way out somewhere where there isn't, that's going to have an impact on how well you can navigate your life with a hearing loss. So just remember all along here, all along this continuum, there are differences. In the senior community, depending on the sources that you read and trust, there are between 36 and 55 million Americans who have some degree of hearing loss. One in three over the age of 65 and two out of three over the age of 75. In the senior population, hearing loss is the third most prevalent but treatable condition after arthritis and hypertension. If the hearing loss goes untreated, it can contribute to other things like balance problems, so therefore falling, anxieties and depression. And the link was shown a few years back with some research that there is a link between untreated hearing loss and early onset dementia, just basically because the brain is working overtime and borrowing from different parts of itself to try to comprehend speech and other things going on around us. 
So when we talk about the types of hearing loss, there are three main types. Conductive hearing loss basically refers to something that's blocking the sound from getting to the brain. It could be wax, it could be fluid be behind the eardrum, it can be bony growths on the stapes. And so that would happen anywhere along the outer and the middle ear. Sensory neural hearing loss, which is what I have, is permanent. And that happens in here in the inner ear. And some people have a combination of conductive and sensory neural. We tend to think of conductive as temporary simply because most of the time it can be helped with medical intervention. So what causes hearing loss? Well, growing older, it is a normal part of aging, blunt trauma to the head, illnesses and viruses, genetics plays a role. Sometimes there can be a tumor, Acoustic neuromas are not that uncommon, and that's a benign growth on the eighth cranial nerve. They monitor that if they discover it because it grows very, very slowly. But if it gets to the point where it's too big, it will have to come out. Medications. There are many what we call ototoxic meds that can cause either temporary or permanent hearing loss and or tinnitus. And then of course, noise is the chief offender of our hearing and we live in a very noisy world today. Okay, so how do we recognize deafness and hearing loss? Sorry, this is going on all the wrong things here. A deaf person might stare blankly or point to their mouth and ear to indicate that they're deaf. They might ask for an interpreter or write notes, but there are deaf people who will wear a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. A hard of hearing person like myself might seem easily anxious and confused and say a lot of huh a lot of time. We may ask for repetition, 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 focus on your lips you now behind the mask or focus on your body language might make an inappropriate response or comment to something that's being said. And of course, wear a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. So is it early onset dementia or is it hearing loss? There are a few similarities. A lack of responsiveness, easily confused, disinterested, behavioral changes, easily agitated, aggressive, or withdrawn and mention this because some years back when I was doing outreach at an assisted living place in Arlington, I learned that they had admitted a 90 year old woman to the memory wing only to discover a few weeks later that her memory was fine, but she was actually deaf. So I think it's important, especially if you have a loved one or a family member who might be starting to exhibit some of these behaviors to double check and see what could be going on because when we are losing our hearing, a lot of this applies. This is a visual. This is kind of what hard of hearing people are up against. If you look at this, it's sort of hard to read. You can see some of it, but what is in all those little yellow, what is all that? And that's what it's like for us when we're hearing. We hear some of it when we're hard of hearing, but not all of it, which is why it's easy for us to get confused. So without these consonant sounds that should be clear, everything sounds kind of muffled or garbled or distorted, and it's so easy to misunderstand, become confused and irritable. If you have ever seen an audiogram, it won't look exactly like this, but when people think they're losing their hearing, they go for hearing evaluation, a professional hearing evaluation. The results are put on an audiogram and the numbers that go across the top refer to the pitch of the sound. You wanna think of it like keys on a piano that go from low to high. The numbers that go down the left refer to the volume, soft to loud. And you see all these loud sounds down here at the bottom of the audiogram. Now, if this patient 
presented with this result, X for the left ear, O for the right ear, this patient would have a mild sloping to severe high frequency hearing loss. Look at this speech banana right in the middle here because it's shaped like a banana. This shows you where speech sounds fall in the pitch range. This patient cannot hear anything that is in orange. So when you look at the sounds that are there, the K, T, S, F, F all these sounds have vanished, which is why it becomes complicated for them to have conversations, especially in a crowded room, because they're getting some of it, but they're not getting all of it. So a person with a mild loss here is going to have difficulty with normal speech and listen with extra effort. Someone with moderate loss will have difficulty understanding loud speech, will need line of sight if they're going to listen to a speaker. They might even be speech reading without realizing it. Someone who has a severe loss coming in here can only understand amplified speech, will need to speak, speech read, maybe write notes and might use sign language. And then somebody who comes in down here at the profound level will have difficulty understanding amplified speech and need oral rehabilitation, speech reading. Sometimes some folks will go on to learn sign language. So here are these three babushkas on a bench. And the first one says, it's windy here. And her friend says, no, it's Thursday. And their friend says, well, I'm thirsty too. Let's make tea. So this is an example of three people having a conversation that really didn't happen because although they could hear each other, they could not understand each other. And look at these high frequency sounds here, the T, the S, the TH. This is why they were having difficulty understanding. And so the impact on everybody is stress and fatigue, not only on folks who have a hearing loss, but anybody who has to communicate with them, your loved ones, your, your healthcare providers, anybody, it can create a lot of stress. And it's normal to feel that way, which is why we have to ultimately learn better communication strategies. There are a lot of myths about hearing loss, but these are the main ones. Oh, she's wearing a hearing aid. She should be able to hear me just fine, right? Or, oh, he has a cochlear implant. Oh, he can hear as well as I can. Can't he? No. Hearing aids and cochlear implants are like glasses for the ears is like one of the top myths because there are limitations. The distance from the sound source, the clarity of the person speaking, some difficult speech patterns, and background noise or other environment, uh, environmental challenges. Hearing aids and cochlear implants, they don't provide the same result for our hearing that glasses can provide for our vision if we have garden variety vision issues, nearsighted, foresighted. You put glasses on, optics can give you 20-20, but this does not work with hearing. And that deaf and hard of hearing people can lip read or speech read. Well, lip reading is really focusing on the lips. And in the last couple of years, that's been really hard for us to do. But speech reading not only focuses on the lips, the teeth, the tongue, the jaw in general, but the eyes and the facial expressions and the body language. We read the whole person. And only 30% of English is actually discernible on the lips, which means 70% is not. And so many words look and sound the same. Time and dime, coat and goat, service, surface, shoes and shoes, the list is endless. When I do these in person, this is the point at which you get a listening quiz, which everybody loves because they get everything wrong. But we are up against that. It's simply another layer of frustration for someone. Low background noise will not bother someone who is deaf or hard of hearing. Any type of background noise is a distraction. And someone who is deaf 
can often hear environmental sounds and feel those vibrations. We've had people call us at NBRC and tell us, I got a job, I'm so excited. But they put my office by the outside air conditioning unit or they put me right by the copy room because they thought, oh, well, he's deaf, so he isn't gonna hear any of this, but we need to be mindful of that. Now, people with hearing loss, they can process sounds quickly and easily. Well, no. Just, I want you to think about your ears for a second and want you to think of them as baseball catcher's mitts, one on each side of your head that catches all the sounds of life and funnels them through the outer, middle, and inner ear to the auditory cortex of the brain, which most of you probably know. That is where the hearing takes place. That's where the sounds are interpreted. So if we have a problem anywhere along here, these sounds kind of limp along to get to the brain where we can interpret them, which is why we don't catch on this fast as a hearing person. And maybe we don't seem too bright, but we're simply trying to, to grasp what is being said. And that can be very tiring and very frustrating. The use of amplification benefits people with hearing loss. This is both false and true. When we listen to speech, it's generally kind of distorted to somebody who is hard of hearing. So when you amplify that through a PA system, if you're giving a presentation and you have that kind of an environment, that is going to be very difficult for a person who is hard of hearing because the distorted speech is now how many ever times louder. On the other hand, a direct feed to the ear can be much more helpful like an FM system, an infrared system, or something hardwired like a Pocket Talker Pro, which is pictured here. A deaf person should rely on a family member or a friend to interpret in a medical setting. This is a huge myth, and it absolutely is not advisable because they're not going, they're going to have a lack of impartiality. They may not be familiar with the vocabulary they're going to be emotionally involved and it can put stress on a relationship. So in any medical setting, it is really imperative that you have a certified professional interpreter, not somebody who's had ASL in high school, a certified interpreter. And then there's the myth that everybody with the hearing loss needs an interpreter, but that's not necessarily true because people like me who are later deafened and the others who are hard of hearing and never learn sign language, they're not going to benefit from an interpreter. We need uh, captioning, reading text is generally a better solution. And as I mentioned before, and I cannot stress this enough, that hearing aids and cochlear implants really are imperfect solutions. They amplify sounds, but they don't always help with clarity. They don't overcome background noise. They must be programmed or mapped properly to the person's hearing loss. They won't overcome distance and they don't help with understanding challenging speech patterns. So it can be frustrating. So if you're in the healthcare field and you have a person that you're taking care of, do they wear, if they wear hearing aids, you wanna be sure the batteries are fresh and that they are in properly and that the hearing aids are in properly because if they're not, they're likely to whistle. And are the hearing aids clean? Are they free of wax? Does the person have rechargeable hearing aids? These are wonderful where they don't have to mess with the little battery compartment, put them in the charger overnight, put them in the next day and bingo, their hearing aids are charged. And then there are amplifiers and apps. So we talked about the pocket talker this is a very popular model. This is the new kid on the block. We have one at NBRC, but we haven't fired it up yet to see how it works. This was the original one. And the pocket talker and the comfort duet is another type of a personal amplifier. There are many. This is just to show you the kinds of things that are out there. 
if the person has a telecoil in their hearing aid, then they can get the loop. It's a little portable neck loop to put around their neck and plug it in to the pocket talker. They don't need to use a headset of any kind. That's what I have. But they have to have that telecoil in their hearing aid. And these are great. They run between $150 and $220, depending. Um, and that's a lot cheaper than thousands of dollars for hearing aids. But this is a good option for them. And then apps. We are living in the age of apps. And let me tell you, I could do a whole program on apps. So I'm just going to tell you about a couple of them. Otter makes a speech to text app for both iPhone and Android. And Google Live Transcribe, which is what I have, and I'm using this right now. So when Steve was talking, I was simply reading this on my phone because I'm keeping it next to the monitor. So that's right here. And that is only for Android. And I paused momentarily to tell a personal story because if you are in healthcare, this, this was a great thing that happened to me a year ago uh, when I had my hip replaced. You know, right before they take you into the operating room, you're in that little pre-op cubicle. And of course, everybody's covered in mask. And I have my Google Live transcribe all the time. And the anesthesiologist came in and she noticed it and she looked at it and she was, oh my goodness, what is that? So I explained it to her. And she, of course, had her mask on and a face shield, like the mask wasn't enough. So she asked about her phone. She said, well, we'll work on my phone. And I, she said, I have an iPhone. And I said, well, then you need otter, like the animal. It does the same thing, but they make that for iPhone. So we finished that conversation. She left the room. The nurses come and do their thing. And then the an anesthesiologist comes back in and she holds up her phone and she says, I have otter. I've downloaded otter onto my phone because I want to be sure that I can communicate with you in the operating room if I have to. I was, I was so blown away. I couldn't believe someone would go to that length. But I thought, what if every healthcare professional had a speech to text app in their phone? It's free. You download it because she knew I wouldn't be the only hard of hearing patient she would ever have. And this was just like news to her. So she felt like, she had a way to communicate not only with me, but with any other patient who would come along who didn't hear well. Just fabulous. There are also captioning apps, which are free. So InnoCaption will, will caption your mobile phone calls, or Hamilton, Captel for mobile. Um, and what this means is if you happen to have that app on your phone, and you're with a patient who needs to make a call, but maybe they don't have a smartphone or their battery is gone, you have a way to make that call for them and they can have a conversation with whoever they need to and read what's being said on the screen on their phone. It's fantastic. So we're going to finish up talking about communication environments and strategies. And I want one thing I... I always want to stress, as if you know or love someone with a hearing loss too, put this in the back of your mind. All communication situations are complex. And the hearing loss itself can be compounded by problems with the speaker, the listener, the environment, or the message. If you change one little thing out of any one of those elements, the outcome can be completely different. This is a whole presentation on its own, but I, I want you to be aware of that. It isn't just the person's hearing loss. These things are involved. And so we're gonna focus on environments because that is so important. We consider them to be unfriendly or friendly. And an unfriendly environment would be a room with large high ceiling, limited lighting, low maintenance floor and wall surfaces, no visual alerting systems, no way to make a phone call, 
with a caption call or an amplified call. A friendly environment will have smaller rooms, lower ceilings, good lighting, carpeted floors, drapes, acoustic ceiling tiles, visual alerts, <laughs> amplified or captioned phones nearby. Echo is something that is very difficult for us to handle. So the environment is very, very important. So as a healthcare worker, can you change the environment? If there is TV or music on in the background, can you turn it off? If the room you're in, it's a, is it too hot or cold? Can you do something about that? If there's too much light behind you or whoever is speaking, can you close drapes or move the speaker away from the light? Are there too many people talking at the same time? Can you ask the group to be quieter? Well, if you cannot change the environment that you're in, change environments if it's possible. So if there's too much echo in the room, you find a quieter setting. This is what I do at the doctor because you know that little exam room, it, it echoes because you know it's all cleanable surfaces. So you've got that, that you know, reflection in the air. So my doctor will come in, do whatever he does. And then we go into his office and close the door because he has carpet, he has curtains and the acoustics in his little office are so much better. And that is where we communicate. And poor acoustic, I can't talk about this enough. Acoustics really do play a role in how well we do. It does cause stress for patients. It can cause stress for staff. It can affect the speech intelligibility among the staff, the patients, and between staff and patients. It can make sleeping difficult and can affect patient behavior. And we mentioned standing in front of bright light. You see why that's a problem? You've got the shadow on the face, which can make it very, very difficult. So you want to be able to see the whole face, even if they've got a mask. At least you can read the rest of the face and the eyes and get the message. You want to get their attention before you start talking, because we need to be in on the beginning of the conversation. One-on-one -on -one communication, face the person. Rephrasing works much better than repeating. Speak at a comfortable pace, have the light on you. You don't want to look down or walk away while you are still talking with or without a mask that works. You want to seek the best possible acoustics, again, with or without a mask. You want to have a room that has no echo if it's possible. You want light to be on your face, not behind you. Having printed materials helps. And of course, maybe you have downloaded an app on your smartphone, which can be helpful. If the person has dementia, you want to approach from the front. Most of you probably already know this. You want to establish eye contact, call the person by name, get down to eye level if needed, let them initiate touch and giving directions one step at a time. And a lot of this also applies for a person who has hearing loss, really for both. And that one step at a time is very, very important because if we have, depending on our level of hearing loss, having multiple instructions given to us like one right after the other can become very confusing. If the person is in a wheelchair, now this is something I have seen over the years. I've been with NVRC now for 21 years and I've gone to many, many places where our seniors are in wheelchairs and I see the hearing aids in them and they're being wheeled around and the person wheeling them is chat, 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 chatting. And whoever's sitting in the wheelchair isn't really getting any, getting any of it. So it's important again, with or without the mask, come around the front and go eye level and do all of the communication that you need to do face to face. And then you get up and continue to push the wheelchair. And if they have to talk to you, stop, come around the front and make sure that the communication is understood. Now, what about a hospital room? What would be helpful here? Can the TV be muted if it's on? 
which is helpful. How about closing the curtains if you have to have stand on that, that side of the bed, if there are curtains and there usually are. But it's better to stand on this side so that the light is not behind you. And then the intercom to the nurse's station, holy cow. For people like me, we can't understand a word that comes through there. It's like listening to aliens. So I have suggested in the past that if you have a note at the nurse's station that would inform whoever is on the shift then patient in X room is deaf or hard of hearing. So when they buzz on the intercom, you just go in, don't talk to them through the intercom system. And then of course we have COVID masks and I, they're going away now, but we're still wearing them at times. And the speech sounds are so blurred and garbled. It really is like living in a foreign language film without subtitles. So what do we do? You try to be patient and sensitive to the situation. You want to try rephrasing and maybe speaking more slowly if they're hearing you at all. You could write notes or, of course, use an app. You don't want to get up real close to the person and shout or walk away in frustration. These are some mask companies that make masks that are very user friendly for us. You probably all already know about these, but Safe and Clear and Clear Mask are two very, very popular ones. And writing notes. Writing notes, texting, apps, lots of different ways to do that. We have a caregiver flyer. And when I do these in person, I usually have a stack of them with me, but I can email the flyer to anybody who might be interested. And if any of you are familiar with Innova, uh, or con connected with Innova, understand that they have a language and disability services and a 24 seven support. So for any communication needs for any of the patients, whether it's an interpreter, a captioner, assistive listening device or whatever language, you can get that pretty much on demand at Innova. And then we do also have a medical placard for people who are deaf and hard of hearing and also deaf blind. This is something that the person can take with them to a medical setting where they will have everything written down about what they have in on the back. They can circle what is wrong and show the, the healthcare provider. And so that brings us to the end of our presentation. And we can take questions now. If you'd like to have a copy of the PowerPoint or the caregiver flyer, or even set up a one-on-one -on -one virtual meeting to talk about maybe somebody that you love or somebody that you're taking care of, um, contact me at boleary at nvrc.org. And I'd be very happy to share that with you or answer any questions that you may have. I'll leave that up for a second. So if anybody needs to copy it, it's right there. And this is great. Bonnie. Yeah, I think I can and, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I went by uh, yeah, I very quickly, but you have it timed. Uh, yeah, 40 minutes. This is great. Okay. Um, All right, here we go. Okay, let's get to some of these questions. But first, I want to share a few a uh, few things. Number one, we did talk about Relay. We talked about Hamilton Relay. Uh, Tarita Turner from Maryland Relay is in the audience and she's dropped her contact info there. So if you're interested in any of the Relay uh, services or the Hamilton products, she's a great um, uh, resource. Um, also, another great resource in our audience is Joan Green. I, I've been lucky. She's been in our um, um, both uh, t today and yesterday's discussion. She's a speech pathologist, but she says these are wonderful tips. Both of my parents have significant hearing loss and I constantly need to advocate for them. I'm a speech pathologist with a special interest in helping elders and um, she left her contact information there. But That's let's, great. Get, let's get into, um, oh, and then um, did you mention a caregiving flyer, Bonnie? Or uh, Yes, we okay. have a caregiver flyer, we do. Send that to me 
um, and I'll post that with your PowerPoint on the recording. Oh, okay, so I can send you my PowerPoint and the caregiver flyer, and then you you can distribute to yeah. whoever. Okay, exactly. all right. This I'm making good. notes, really. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so this. Uh, um, okay, so first question that we have here: What are some of the autotoxic meds? Did you mention? Some um, Hold on, I'm writing this down. Autotoxic medications. We have a book that thick at the office. Um, we also have a list of, I guess you could say, the most common autotoxic meds. And if you're interested in having me send you a copy of that, I can either send it to Steve so that he has it in his arsenal, or I can you can email me and I can send it to you privately either way. That's probably a good one for, um, so the person that asked that question, if you um, just reach out to Bonnie with her email there that I dropped into. Um, uh, right, okay, that, yeah, that'd be great. Let's do that, absolutely, um, okay. Okay, um, and then, oh, this is funny, Krista says, uh, when you were talking about the reader on the iPhone, then she sort of makes a comment, and then you need your glasses to read it. Yes, uh, I. Uh, <laughs> um, you, we can't win, can we? Uh, I tell you. Um, okay, and uh, then uh, any suggestions for getting someone to op open to the idea that they may have some hearing loss? or problems understanding spoken language. I can't get my husband to get his hearing tested, but he's constantly asking me to repeat what I said on the TV. And are there any home screening tests? Um, let, me, let me put it this way. There are tests you can take. If you go on some of the hearing aid websites, I was doing some research on this. You can do like an online, you know, through your computer. I honestly don't know how accurate those are. We, I don't, or if you're in Northern Virginia and you can convince your husband to come to NVRC and have me screen him, it won't take very long. And what our screening shows is whether he would benefit from going to an audiologist. But there are TV listening systems. So again, if you're in our area, you can make an appointment with Debbie Jones and come into our demo room and take a look at what might be helpful because it will help you too, if he can understand what is on the TV. Have you tried using the closed captions? Because um, I, I need the closed captions. It doesn't matter how loud it is, you need to have the closed captions. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, Betty, hopefully you, you heard that and you've played around with the, the closed captions. Uh, he won't read the closed captions and I'm in Maryland. Okay. Um, so, so a couple, a, a couple of things too. Um, the, uh, actually like Joan Green might be a great resource for you in Maryland. Also Maryland Relay, reach out to Tina on, on the discussion. Uh, Cause um, that could be a, a great resource. The other thing, um, I know that your colleagues have talked about the TV ears um, and and I know some, I, you know, Betty, it sounds like your your husband may be resistant to a lot of things, but I know that whenever I've talked to somebody that's been willing to try the TV ears assisted listening device, their mind is just blown because it's the experience of watching TV is so much more enjoyable, but, but I think their spouses and loved ones probably enjoy it even better because it's not <laughs> blasted. Um, so Betty, hopefully those are some good resources for you. Um, and, you know, I, I would say I've been kind of shocked on hearing loss and hearing aids and screening for hearing tests given that the devices now are practically invisible that like you you can't see them there is such a stigma around hearing testing and hearing aids i i mean for for i guess what we would call sort of normal age related hearing loss it i think it's one of these things where people they looked at their grandfather who had a hearing aid and 
it's this age stigma that, oh, I can't believe that I need a hearing aid or that I may have some hearing loss. And um, it just getting screened and tested is just so important. I, and what often gets me, what, where I can get people off the mark is <laughs> we, we joke about hearing our spouse, you know, and talking to our spouse. But when you bring up like a grandchild or somebody like that, don't you want to hear what your grandchildren are saying? Sometimes that gets people off the mark. Steve, can I throw something in right yeah, there? Okay. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that the size of the hearing aid is not what's what's consequential. It's what the hearing aid can do for you. And this focus on having them be invisible sometimes backfires because people who want and de they demand to have an invisible hearing aid, but it isn't the right hearing aid for them. So the important thing is that the person gets matched with the hearing aid that is best for their hearing loss. And it may or may not help with the grandchildren. Okay, so you, you, know, you, you kind of have to be realistic about that part. Okay, thanks for bringing me down to uh, to earth on that discussion, but that's very important because you're coming from a very authentic place. Um, Jeannie says, what about support groups for both the hard of hearing and their families? Uh, there are support groups. I don't know where you are um, here in Northern Virginia. Right before COVID, we formed the Hearing Loss Connection of Northern Virginia, and then COVID happened. So we're, we're trying to scramble and figure out what we're going to do about that. But that is at NVRC in our large meeting room. And when we get back, back to SNF, we'll be meeting once a month. Um, you can contact the Hearing Loss Association of America. That is the national organization and their headquarters are in Bethesda in Maryland. That's uh, hearingloss.org. Um, and they may be able to hook you up with an HLAA chapter because there are many chapters across the country. And this is exactly what they provide as support for people with hearing loss. Okay. And I am just dropping that website into chat. I also, um, Tina is a great resource today from Maryland Relay. Tarita, sorry. And she Hi. says, Betty and everyone, uh, the hearing and speech agency may be able to help with hearing screening. And she has the link there for everybody. Um, um, and Krista Kramer says for Betty, Betty, uh, these are some great resources for you. If he has a smartphone, the Petrolax app does a hearing test that then adjusts the hearing amplifier app that he could try listening through, and that might give him an idea of how much he is missing. Huh. That's good. And actually, there are apps now that go with, if, depending on the model of the hearing aids that you get, there are apps that go to your phone, so you never have to touch your hearing aids. If you're in a restaurant, you just pick up your phone and you do the adjustment right there on your smartphone. I mean, it's quite incredible what you can do now. Okay. But I didn't know they did a hearing. I don't know if it's a hearing test or adjusting your hearing based on the environment that you're in. Great. Okay, uh, Lonnie has a great question here. <laughs> Don't know if you can answer this, but uh, do you have any tips for ways to help ensure that residents in nursing homes or patients in hospitals do not lose their hearing aids? I, I think this is something that a lot of healthcare professionals are probably challenged with. That is a really, really tough one. I know that most hospitals would rather you did not bring your hearing aids if you need to have a surgical procedure. I insisted because I've got the big, the big ones, then they're not falling out. But otherwise, I would have been encouraged to please leave them at home. I don't know in nursing homes. I have no idea. You may want to have a, a Ziploc bag and every time they take out their hearing aids, they put them in a Ziploc bag, a nice big one and keep it in a safe place. Sometimes memory issues come into play and that can be very, very frustrating. There's no real easy solution for that. Great. Um, Anne says, my mom has not only hearing loss, but also ADD and short-term memory impairment. The Otter app sounds great. Will this download to a laptop or a tablet? Uh, 
with down, down, yes, it will, hang on. I'm sorry, I had, I had another message pop up here. Okay. Um, if she has a smartphone and has an app, I think she could put the app on a tablet. I don't know about a laptop. That I don't know. I don't okay. have a laptop, believe it or not. And I'm but trying. To... I know people download things onto their tablets, so it's possible. You have to look and see what you have. Okay. And I'm I'm looking at an uh, the the Otter is the it's a voice notes app, correct? Yeah. Uh, I want to make sure I share the right link with everybody. Okay. Yeah. Looking at Otter, Otter will take notes for you. And if you go into a meeting, Otter will save the transcription of it and email it to you afterwards. Okay. Um, all right. I'll, sh I'll make sure to share that, that link with everybody. Uh, Veronica says, I work in a memory care unit and residents often lose them. And and we have to pay. Um, do some have like a tracking device? Like, um, do you know? Does any or does anybody know? Are there like? Trust me, I'm constantly losing my keys in my wallet, and so I have one of those little tile things. Um, I I wonder if any of the hearing aid devices have trackers. I am not aware of anything like that. But did you say, am I understanding this correctly? If you are in a nursing home or if the patient loses their hearing aids, you have to pay for them? That's did I understand like that? what she okay. said, because pr probably the, uh, I bet you anything that they've, they've taken that stance just because, you know, the families are sort of bl maybe blaming the staff that the staff should be, um, monitoring this which you know is it would be very difficult but you can see wow. for somebody with memory impairment i mean it's sure. sort of it's this double-edged sword uh man um well i i i was gonna say to um veronica my heart breaks for you and your colleagues because i know that that is probably very challenging um let's see um uh Joan says, my parents use something similar to what people use to hang sunglasses. And she also mentions that Otter works on laptops and she's provided the Otter AI app. Um, yeah, I, I, you know what's otter.ai is the, the website. Yeah, I went to that website and um, what's nice about Otter is, is that it's a, a platform that could help all of us, but it can really help people with hearing loss. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Veronica follows up. Yes, we have to refund or pay for new ones. It runs in the thousands. Um, boy, if there's any entrepreneurs out there or any uh, creative types that can come up with a solution for Veronica and the memory care communities that uh, have um, residents with hearing aids, uh, that could be a really great business opportunity. Um, and oh, let's see, Veronica, your hand is raised. I'll let you, I'll open up your mic to talk, but you may have already, we may have already answered all your questions. Um, and Lauren says, um, are there ways to distinguish between hearing loss and dementia? If not, do we know how much this lack of awareness is contributing to misdiagnosis of dementia? Um, Lauren, one of our recent discussions with was with Dr. Monsbach, who really does a lot of work in this area and accurately diagnosing somebody with dementia. And that is one of the things you know, hearing loss, vision loss, um, uh, medications. There's so many things that could misdiagnose someone, but you could really see, Bonnie, uh, wouldn't you say that somebody with hearing loss, their behavior may be very similar to somebody who who has cognitive impairment if, if it's severe. Right, yeah, some of those behaviors at the beginning can be very similar. So if you have a professional hearing evaluation by a licensed 
audiologist or healthcare professional, that that will determine, first of all, if there's hearing loss. And then you can go from there. I'm not a dementia expert, so I'm not, I'm not really qualified to comment on that end of it. But I would first get the hearing tested to see what's going on. Okay. Um, well, okay, we got through all of the, the oh, of course, it says uh, Veronica again. And Veronica, you, you, you and Joan get a gold star today for, it, uh, <laughs> for some great questions. I'm a dementia practitioner, and I can tell you hearing loss is also associated with dehydration, confusion, confusion, and delirium, which can be confused with dementia. Rule out all of these first. Um, great advice. Um, uh, Veronica. And um, Carol says, do you know of any resources that could help pay for expensive hearing aids for the low income elderly? Um, one thing, well, uh, Bonnie, do you, do you know any? Right. This is, we get asked this question all the time. This is probably the most frustrating one. But Starkey Foundation used to, they have shut down. The Lions Club has an affordable hearing aid program, and I have met several people who've used it in recent years, um, and I don't know how satisfied they are. The hearing aids are reconditioned, and that's okay, but um, we don't really know whether they're the best ones for the people who have the hearing loss. It's very, very difficult right now. I think a lot of people are looking at the over-the-counter hearing aids who... Um, uh, over the, they're supposed to be available this fall, uh, which will bring the price down. But again, the market for those hearing aids are people with mild to mild to moderate hearing loss, not people like me. Okay. But you can try the Lions Club. That is a, one resource. I dropped that in there. And then, you know, like just word of mouth is sometimes a great way yes. to find about funding sources that you may have never imagined like and I'm, I'm throwing this out we're going to have a discussion on affordability here in, in the next month or so but like one thing that i've heard of and 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 again d don't shoot the messenger here but for example if the person that you're looking for to who needs a hearing aid is a member of a church you know talking to the pastor sometimes there's some creative ways that the community will rally around an individual who really needs something to live a purposeful life. And um, and and a lot of times faith based organizations, they're waiting for opportunities to help their um, their members in a way like this. Um, uh, and uh, Tarita says, Carol, if you're in Maryland, check with Hasa. Um, they have uh, a program that helps with hearing aids, but I think it's grant funded, so it depends on on the funds. Diamond Hill is the person who heads up that program. Great, uh, again, Tarita, so glad that you're here on this program today. Um, Jeannie says this presentation session has been so extremely helpful. Um, Carol, some special needs dual eligible insurance plans. Okay, yeah, th good point. Um, some of the insurance plans, I know the Medicare, Medicare Advantage plans have things that are on um, uh, for hearing aids. Um, and uh, yes, Bonnie? I just learned two weeks ago that one of Aetna's Medicare plans offers $5,000 for hearing aids. Hmm. So that blew me away. I don't know what particular Medicare Medicare program that is with that number, but they have a whole hearing benefit section now. And that is really pretty decent. Medicaid generally will cover hearing aids for children. Um, there's not a lot of help there for older people. Medicare will cover the cost of the evaluation if your primary care refers you. We're still battling with everybody else who supports hearing loss with our government to please provide hearing aids for people and make it part of Medicare, but you know, it's a, it's an uphill climb. Well, <laughs> and, and, and Carol, um, I, uh, Carol mentions that in Missouri, uh, that her aunt is in Missouri. And I did a search and Missouri 
the governor in 2019 started a hearing aid distribution program and uh, signed legislation to initiate a program to help low income Missourians afford hearing aids. So I right. dropped that in there. I mean, again, this is sort of, we got to be resourceful here, folks, uh, especially when we're talking affordability. Well, let's, let's wrap things up. But Bonnie, you're such an authentic presenter. I want to kind of close with you're a person with hearing loss. Um, wh what do you wish if you could share with our audience when so when somebody is approaching you, let's say a stranger in the grocery store, what are some things that you would like people to know about communicating and and with somebody with hearing loss? Just mainly that the most important thing is to try to speak clearly. And we speak very fast today. Everybody speaks fast. People on TV speak fast. The newspaper, everybody. It's like, how many words can I get into 30 seconds? But when you're speaking with a person with a hearing loss, this makes it very difficult to speak not so at a comfortable pace and speak in being aware of the fact that they, if they don't understand you the first time, rephrasing is a great strategy. If you say the same thing over and over again and they didn't get it the first time, they're probably not going to get it the second time. So speak com at a comfortable pace, face the person, be sensitive, try not to get impatient, no eye rolls and walking away because that happens a lot. And uh, just be aware that they're intelligent, that they just take a little longer to catch on to what you're saying. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, uh, Bonnie, on another great presentation. And uh, thank you to our audience who has contributed so many great resources as well. Um, I will make sure to get this up this afternoon on proaging.com and um, and Bonnie send over all the resources and I'll, I'll throw everything up on the same page. I'm sending two, correct? The PowerPoint and the caregiver flyer. Yeah, and actually somebody did ask, they said that I should post the uh, the medication thing. Oh, okay, fine. So three things, Yeah. medication, caregiver, PowerPoint. Okay, just so I know, just so I understand it. Great, okay. all right, thanks, thanks again. All right, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Steve.